Section 20 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 29. Francis I and the Renaissance, Part 5. A few words have already been said about the development of the arts, especially architecture and sculpture, in the Middle Ages, and of the characteristics, original and national, Gallic and Christian, which belonged to them at this period, particularly in respect of their innumerable churches, great and small. A foreglance has been given of the alteration which was brought about in those characteristics at the date of the sixteenth century, by the Renaissance, at the same time that the arts were made to shine with fresh and vivid lustre. Francis I was their zealous and lavish patron. He reveled in building and embellishing palaces, castles, and hunting-boxes, Saint-Germain, Chenonceau, Fontainebleau, and Chambord. His chief counsellors, Chancellor Duprat and Admiral Bonivet, shared his taste and followed his example. Several provinces, and the banks of the Loire especially, became covered with splendid buildings, bearing the marks of a complicated character which smacked of imitations from abroad. Italy, which from the time of Charles the Eighth and Louis the Twelfth had been the object of French kings' ambition, and the scene of French wars, became also the school of French art. National and solemn Christian traditions were blended, whilst taking an altered form, with the Italian resuscitation of Greek and Roman antiquity. Italian artists, such as Rosso of Florence, Primatici of Bologna, Niccolo dell'Abate of Modena, and Benevenuto Cellini of Florence, came and settled in France, and there inspired and carried out the king's projects and works. Leonardo da Vinci, full of years and discontented with his Italian patrons, accompanied Francis I to France, and died in his arms at the castle of Clou near Amboise, where he had fixed his residence. Some great French artists, such as the painter John Cousin and the sculptor John Goujon, strove ably to uphold the original character and merits of French art, but they could not keep themselves entirely aloof from the influence of this brilliant Italian art, for which Francis I's successors, even more than he, showed a zealous and refined attachment, but of which he was in France the first patron. We will not quit the first half of the sixteenth century and the literary and philosophical renaissance which characterizes that period, without assigning a place therein at its proper date and in his proper rank to the name, the life, and the works of the man who was not only its most original and eminent writer, but its truest and most vivid representative, Rabelais. Francis Rabelais, who was born at Chinon in 1495 and died at Paris in 1553, wandered during those fifty-eight years about France and Europe, from town to town, from profession to profession, from good to bad, and from bad to good estate, first a monk of the Cordeliers, then with Pope Clement the Seventh's authority, a Benedictine, then putting off the monk's habit, and assuming that of a secular priest, in order to roam the world, Quote, incurring, as he himself says, in this vagabond life, the double stigma of suspension from orders and apostasy, unquote. then studying medicine at Montpellier, then medical officer of the great hospital at Lyon, but before long superseded in that office, quote, for having been twice absent without leave, unquote. then staying at Lyon as a corrector of proofs, a compiler of almanacs, an editor of diverse books for learned patrons, and commencing the publication of his Vie Trésorifique du Grand Gargantua, Père de Pantagruel, or Most Horrifying Life of the Great Gargantua, Father of Pantagruel, which was immediately preceded against by the Sorbonne, quote, as an obscene tale, unquote. On grounds of prudence, or necessity, Rabelais then quitted Lyon and set out for Rome as physician attached to the household of Cardinal John du Bellay, Bishop of Paris and envoy from France to the Holy See, the which bishop, quote, having relished the profound learning and competence of Rabelais, and having besides discovered in him fine humour and a conversation capable of diverting the blackest melancholy, retained him near his person in the capacity of physician in ordinary to himself and all his family, and held him ever afterwards in high esteem, unquote. 
After two years passed at Rome, and after rendering all sorts of service in his patron's household, Rabelais, quote, feeling that the uproarious life he was leading and his licentious deeds were unworthy of a man of religion and a priest, unquote, asked Pope Paul III for absolution, and at the same time permission to resume the habit of St. Benedict, and to practice, quote, for piety's sake, without hope of gain, and in any and every place, unquote, the art of medicine, wherein he had taken, he said, the degrees of bachelor, licentiate, and doctor. A brief of Pope Paul III's, dated January 17, 1536, granted his request. Seventeen months afterwards, on the 22nd of May, 1537, Rabelais reappears at Montpellier, and there receives, it is said, the degree of doctor, which he had already taken upon himself to assume. He pursues his life of mingled science and adventure, gives lessons, and gads about so much that, quote, his doctor's gown and cap are preserved at Montpellier, according to tradition, all dirty and torn, but objects of respectful reminiscence, unquote. In 1538, Rabelais leaves Montpellier and goes to practice medicine at Narbonne, Castres, and Lyon. In 1540, he tires of it, resumes, as he had authority to do, the habit of a canon of saint maur and settles in that residence, quote, a paradise, as he himself says, of salubrity, amenity, serenity, convenience, and all the chaste pleasures of agriculture and country life, unquote. Between 1540 and 1551, he is nevertheless found once more wandering far away from this paradise in France, Italy, and perhaps England. He completes and publishes under his own name the Fait et Dicte Héroïque de Pantagruel, and obtains from Francis I a faculty for the publication of, quote, these two volumes not less useful than delightful, which the printers had corrupted and perverted in many passages, to the great displeasure and detriment of the author, and to the prejudice of readers. Unquote. The work made a great noise. The Sorbonne resolved to attack it in spite of the king's approbation. But Francis I died on the 31st of March, 1547. Rabelais relapsed into his life of embarrassment and vagabondage. On leaving France he had recourse, first at Metz, and afterwards in Italy, to the assistance of his old and ever well-disposed patron, Cardinal John du Bellay. On returning to France, he obtained from the new king, Henry II, a fresh faculty for the printing of his books, quote, in Greek, Latin, and Tuscan, unquote, and almost at the same time, on the 18th of January, 1551, Cardinal du Bellay, Bishop of Paris, conferred upon him the cure of Saint Martin at Meudon, quote, which he discharged, says his biographer Colletet, with all the sincerity, all the uprightness, and all the charity that can be expected of a man who wishes to do his duty and to the satisfaction of his flock. Unquote. Nevertheless, when the new holder of the cure at Meudon, shortly after his installation, made up his mind to publish the fourth book of the Fait et Dict Héroïque du Bon Pantagruel, the work was censured by the Sorbonne, and interdicted by decree of Parliament, and authority to offer it for sale was not granted, until on the ninth of February, 1552, Rabelais had given in his resignation of his cure at Meudon, and of another cure which he possessed, under the title of Benefice, in the Diocese of Le Mans. He retired in bad health to Paris, where he died shortly afterwards, in 1553, quote, in Rue des Jardins, parish of St. Paul, in the cemetery whereof he was interred, says Colletet, close to a large tree which was still to be seen a few years ago, unquote. Such a life, this constant change of position, profession, career, taste, patron, and residence, bore a strong resemblance to what we should nowadays call a bohemian life, and everything shows that Rabelais' habits, without being scandalous, were not more regular or more dignified than his condition in the world. Had we no precise and personal information about him in this respect, still his literary work, Gargantua and Pantagruel, would not leave us in any doubt there is no printed book, sketch, conversation, or story which is more coarse and cynical, and which testifies, whether as regards the author or the public for whom the work is intended, to a more complete and habitual dissoluteness in thought, 
morals, and language. There is certainly no ground for wondering that the Sorbonne, in proceeding against the vie trésorifique du grand gargantua, père de Pantagruel, should have described it as, quote, an obscene tale, unquote, and the whole part of Parnurge, the brilliant talker of the tale, quote, take him for all in all the best boy in the world, unquote, which fully justifies the Sorbonne. But by way of striking contrast, at the same time that the works of Rabelais attest the irregularity of men's lives and minds, they also reveal the great travail that is going on, and the great progress that has already been made in the intellectual condition of his day, in the influence of natural and legitimate feelings, and in the appreciation of men's mutual rights and duties. Sixty-two years ago, M. Guizot published, in a periodical collection entitled Annales de l'Education, a study of Rabelais' ideas compared with the practice and routine of his day in respect of education, an important question in the sixteenth as it is in the nineteenth century. It will be well to quote here from that study certain fragments which will give some notion of what new ideas and tendencies were making their way into the social life of France, and were coincident with that great religious and political ferment which was destined to reach bursting point in the reign of Francis I, and to influence for nearly a century the fortunes of France. Quote, it was no easy matter, were the words used by M. Guizot in 1811, to speak reasonably about education at the time when Rabelais wrote. There was then no idea of home education and the means of rendering it practicable. As to public education, there was no extensive range, and nothing really useful to the community in the instruction received by children at college. No justice and no humanity in the treatment they experienced, a fruitless and ridiculously prolonged study of words, succeeded by a no less fruitless study of interminable subtleties. And all this fruitless knowledge, driven into the brains of children by help of chastisements, blows, and that barbarous severity which seems to regard the compel intrar as the principal law and object of instruction. How proceed in such a state of things to conceive a plan of liberal, gentle, and reasonable education? Rabelais, in his book, had begun by avoiding the danger of directly shocking received ideas. By transporting both himself and his heroes to the regions of imagination and extravagance, he had set himself at liberty to bring them up in quite a different fashion than that of his times. The rectors of colleges could not pretend that Pantagruel, who was hardly born before he sucked down at every meal the milk of four thousand six hundred cows, and for whose first shirt there had been cut nine hundred ells of Chantalereau linen, was a portrait of any of the little boys who trembled at their ferules. Pantagruel is in his cradle. He is bound and swathed in it, like all children at that time, but ere long Gargantua, his father, perceives that these bands are constraining his movements, and that he is making efforts to burst there. He immediately, by advice of the princes and lords present, orders the said shackles to be undone, and lo, Pantagruel is no longer uneasy, and thus became he big and strong full early. There came, however, the time when his instruction must begin." My will, said Gargantua, is to hand him over to some learned man for to indoctrinate him according to his capacity, and to spare nothing to that end. He accordingly put Pantagruel under a great teacher, who began by bringing him up under the fashion of those times. He taught him his charte, or alphabet, to such purpose that he could say it by heart backwards, and he was five years and three months about it. Then he read with him Donatus and Facetus, old elementary works on Latin grammar, and he was thirteen years, six months, and two weeks over that. Then he read with him the De Modis, Significandi, with the commentaries of Hertubicius, Fasquin, and a heap of others, and he was more than eighteen years and eleven months over them, and knew them so well that he proved on his fingers to his mother that De Modis Significandi non erat scientia. After so much labor and so many years, what did Pantagruel know? Gargantua was no bigot. He did not shut his eyes that he might not see, and he believed what his eyes told him. He saw that Pantagruel worked very hard and spent all his time at it, and yet he got no good by it. And what was worse, he was becoming daft, silly, dreamy, and besotted through it. 
So Pantagruel was taken away from his former masters, and handed over to Ponocrates, a teacher of quite a different sort, who was bidden to take him to Paris to make a new creature of him, and complete his education there. Ponocrates was very careful not to send him to any college. Rabelais, as it appears, had a special aversion for Montague College. Tempest, says he, was a great boy-flogger at Montague College. If for flogging poor little children, unoffending schoolboys, pedagogues are damned, he, upon my word of honour, is now on Ixion's wheel, flogging the dock-tailed cur that turns it. Pantagruel's education was now humane and gentle. Accordingly, he soon took pleasure in the work which Ponocrates was at the pains of rendering interesting to him, by the very nature and the variety of the subjects of it. Is it not a very remarkable phenomenon, that at such a time and in such a condition of public instruction, a man should have had sufficient sagacity not only to regard the natural sciences as one of the principal subjects of study which ought to be included in a course of education, but further to make the observation of nature the basis of that study? to fix the pupil's attention upon examination of facts, and to impress upon him the necessity of applying his knowledge by studying those practical arts and industries which profit by such applications. That, however, Rabelais did, probably by dint of sheer good sense, and without having any notion himself about the wide bearing of his ideas. Ponocrates took Pantagruel through a course of what we should nowadays call practical study of the exact and natural sciences, as they were understood in the sixteenth century. But at the same time, far from forgetting the moral sciences, he assigns to them for each day a definite place and an equally practical character. As soon as Pantagruel was up, he says, some page or other of the sacred scripture was read to him aloud and distinctly with pronunciation suited to the subject in accordance with the design and purport of this lesson he at frequent intervals devoted himself to doing reverence and saying prayers to the good god whose majesty and marvellous judgments were shown forth in what was read when evening came he and his teacher briefly recapitulated together after the manner of the pythagoreans all that he had read, seen, learned, and heard in the course of the whole day. They prayed to God the Creator, worshipping Him, glorifying Him for His boundless goodness, giving Him thanks for all the time that was past, and commending themselves to His divine mercy for all that was to come. This done, they went to their rest. And at the end of this course of education, so complete both from the worldly and the religious point of view, Rabelais shows us young Pantagruel living in affectionate and respectful intimacy with his father Gargantua, who, as he sees him off on his travels, gives him these last words of advice, Science without conscience is naught but ruin to the soul. It behooves thee to serve, love, and fear God. Have thou in suspicion the abuses of the world. Set not thine heart on vanity, for this life is transitory, but the word of God abideth for ever. Reverence thy teachers, flee the company of those whom thou wouldest not resemble, and when thou feelest sure that thou hast acquired all that is to be learned yonder, return to me that I may see thee, and give thee my blessing ere I die." After what was said above about the personal habits and the works of Rabelais, these are certainly not the ideas, sentiments, and language one would expect to find at the end and as the conclusion of his life and his book. And it is precisely on account of this contrast that more space has been accorded in this history to the man and his book than would in the natural course of things have been due to them. At the bottom, and beyond their mere appearances, the life and the book of Rabelais are a true and vivid reflection of the moral and social ferment characteristic of his time, a time of innovation and of obstruction, of corruption and of regeneration, of decay and of renaissance, all at once. A deeply serious crisis in a strong and complicated social system, which had been hitherto exposed to the buffets and the risks of brute force, but was intellectually full of life and aspiration, was in travail of a double yearning for reforming itself and setting itself in order, and did indeed, in the sixteenth century, attempt at one and the same time a religious and a political reformation, the object whereof, missed as it was at that period, is still at the bottom of all true Frenchmen's trials and struggles. This great movement of the sixteenth century we are now about to approach, and will attempt to fix its character with precision, and mark the imprint of its earliest steps. End of section 20